advice do you think you could give David moving forwards other than, than what you're giving him here? The advice is always in life is follow your heart if you can afford to do something which is worthwhile for you. Not for others, do it for yourself first. Have pleasure in what you're doing and if you stop liking what you're doing, change. There's one life you're responsible for making it as pleasurable as you can for yourself. That's your responsibility in life, I think. That's your one chance. People who are deeply unhappy with their life need to change it. And most of them can. And if you can, follow your passion. Yeah. That's all I can say. David Diley, uh, 32, typical ordinary northern lad I suppose, um, just doing exactly the same thing that most people do, falling into a job that I never really saw myself doing, just to pay the bills, just to get by, make ends meet, and that wasn't what I thought as a child I'd end up doing. Um, I woke up one day with that sense of dread and just thought, you know, is this my life, is this what I've got to look forward to for the next 50 years? Uh, I couldn't take the thought of that and just decided on the spot that, that was it, I wasn't going to do it anymore. And I went in and quit. Uh, I was out by the Wednesday, um, no safety net or anything like that, and I thought, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to go and try and achieve what I've wanted to achieve. I believe in the power of dreams. I believe that ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things. Uh, and this is my dream, uh, to go and make this film. And what kind of film is it? It's a love story. My journey takes me over 10,000 miles away from England to the South Pacific, stopping briefly on the way in South Korea before finally arriving in Nandi, a town on the western coast of Viti Levu, part of the beautiful island nation of Fiji. Fiji is made up of 333 separate islands, with an estimated population of almost 900,000 inhabitants, boasting a rich and varied cultural heritage, with roots stretching around a diverse array of nationalities, and which even today, maintains its traditional tribal structure and customs. When our forefathers first arrived uh, onto all these islands, they sailed in big canoes. They believed in their own way. They believed in their own supernatural gods that protected them, that they guided them through the seas more than 3,000 years ago. And when our first our forefathers arrived on this main island, the island we're on, which is called Vitilevu, they arrived on, in the west of this island. And the place that they arrived on the west of this island uh, is called Vunda. Vunda means the origin. 
There are numerous reasons to come and visit Fiji, but for me, one reason in particular stands head and shoulders above any other. The world's biggest bull sharks. Hundreds of them. Shark Reef Marine Reserve is probably one of the greatest conservation success stories ever, but no one really knows about it. So one of the reasons why I'm here is to, to come and actually tell that story. I think that I've probably got quite a, a childlike enthusiasm for sharks. When I first got into sharks, it wasn't as uh, maybe fashionable as it is now. It wasn't as commonplace. I just saw this animal, I learned that this animal existed, that I just wanted to know everything about. And it was just this love, this immediate sort of love at first sight kind of thing. Um, and that hasn't changed. I mean, I've looked more into the, the factual side of things and as the years have gone by, I've developed my knowledge and, and tried to use that for certain things. But that initial passion, that childlike passion that was there 29 years ago, is still there today. So that hasn't developed that much. Probably just got bigger, if anything. A friend of mine, very, very famous underwater photographer, Doug Perrine, sent me a uh, sent me an article that was published in Diver magazine by this guy I've never heard about, David Diley, about shark feeding. And uh, the article was pretty good. And Doug Perrine said, "Look at this, this is pretty good." And then David, a while later, found out about it and then got in contact with this harebrained idea of his. And there is a great story here which hasn't been properly told, you know? I mean, his idea is what can the common person do, the ordinary person, and he considers himself an ordinary person, which isn't true because, I mean, by what he has done, he has already proven that he's not an ordinary person. At the end of the day, you know, I just wanted to give a guy a break. You know, my downside in this is very small, okay? Uh, unless he depicts me as a complete lunatic, for which I would sue him, you know. After a life of dreaming, the day has finally come. My first dive with the bull sharks of Shark Reef. Two boats leave our base in Pacific Harbour, taking the 15 minute journey to the dive site. There are no nerves, just excitement, as I prepare myself for what legendary undersea filmmakers Ron and Valerie Taylor call the best shark dive in the world. In the first of two dives, we make our way down to an artificial reef wall at a depth of 30 meters. The bulls are already waiting. Staying low, holding onto the reef and protected by a team of safety divers, clients watch as the feeder arrives with a wheelie bin stuffed with tuna heads. More sharks arrive. As the feeder descends, the sharks moving closer, growing in confidence and surrounding me on all sides. I've been allowed in front of the wall and get a ringside view as the first sharks move in to feed. The worse than usual visibility seems to make the sharks bolder. And although not aggressive, the energy levels noticeably increase. And then my heart stops. From nowhere, a large female thunders towards me, hitting my camera dead on. Already, I've learned my first lesson on Shark Reef. Never be off your guard. Being this close to 50 bull sharks, sharks the media refers to as the world's most dangerous shark, is a humbling and exhilarating experience. Power, speed, agility, they exude a charisma and confidence I have never seen present in any other animal, even other sharks. 
and they are everywhere, always watching, always aware of everything going on around them. This, to me, is heaven. After around 15 minutes, which seems to have passed in the blink of an eye, the clanging of lead weight on a dive tank signals everyone to begin their ascent for the second part of the dive. We move as a group to a depth of 10 metres, where another feeder, Papa, is waiting. To see so many sharks on one reef is like nothing I've ever experienced. I am energised and invigorated. Navigating my way through a crowd of grey reef sharks, I take my place with the other divers, facing in towards the upper reaches of the reef, holding onto the edge of a small ledge which juts out into the steep drop-off as Papa hand feeds grey reef and white tip reef sharks. It's immediately apparent the energy of these sharks is different. The measured, self-assured approach of the huge bulls is replaced by a faster and more frantic pace of these smaller, lithe and amped up sharks. To see the reef come alive and to be surrounded by sharks at every turn is an incredible experience. This is why I came to Fiji. Again, the signal sounds and we ascend to four meters where Papa feeds the gathered group of black and white tip reef sharks. I climb into a hole on the reef and I'm immediately surrounded. I have never seen so many sharks on a shallow reef before. They greet Papa like a friend, eagerly competing for his attention. There is no fear. They buzz around me, bumping me from all sides. Not through aggression or clumsiness, but a tactile communication that this is all for them, and I am nothing more than just a temporary guest. After 45 minutes, the first dive is over, and we return to the boat for a surface interval. An hour later, we re-enter the water for the second dive, where another wheelie bin stuffed with tuna heads is used in conjunction with food already inside a steel box chained to the reef. I make my way to the viewing area for a stationary dive at 15 metres. Once again, the sharks are already waiting, well versed in the process and all too aware of the tuna heads packed into the steel box, nudging it, impatient for the feed to begin. With the skill and poise of an expert matador, he hand feeds the ever-growing number of enthusiastic sharks. Some more polite and well-mannered than others. The sheer vastness and girth of these enormous animals seems more apparent when swimming further from the bottom. But with that size comes grace and elegance, a poise for which they are rarely, if ever, given the credit they deserve. And then, once again, a reminder of their power. At the culmination of the feed, the remaining tuna heads are dropped into the huge group of appreciative sharks, and they battle for the few remaining scraps, the faster and more alert gaining the spoils. Both dives are like an injection of adrenaline into my soul. I feel alive, empowered and humbled. That is incredible. That is absolutely amazing. It's just amazing how close they get. And it's so big just coming up to you and sort of looking you right in the eye and you that connection that you get between sort of you and the shark as they come closer and it sort of you get the feeling there that you feel sort of relaxed and calm but still excited at the same time. It's really, really weird. Well that was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Nothing can prepare you for when you actually get to that point where you're sharing space with 50, 60 massive bull sharks. And today was really, really amazing and it's given me the, uh, it's given me the bug now. I want to get closer. As I spend the afternoon in more sedate surroundings, I can't help but reflect upon the huge size and vast numbers of sharks at Shark Reef. A place unique in that I struggle to think of anywhere else which can offer guaranteed shark sightings in such huge groups. But it hasn't always been like this. 
Until as recently as 1999, the place identified by the British Admiralty as Shark Reef was completely dead. No fish, no soft coral, and despite its name, no sharks. This reef, only a mile away, but crucially, outside the protection of the marine reserve, bears the scars of decades of overfishing. Where coral once bloomed lies rubble, and what was once a prosperous fishing ground, where hundreds of fish species flourished, is now reduced to a marine desert, devoid of color. The traditional owners, the village of Naloa, had pretty much given up hope on Shark Reef. So when a dive operator asked the village chiefs for their permission to try and attract sharks to the area, they felt they had nothing to lose, gave their blessing, and the feeding of sharks and Shark Reef began. As the years progressed, more and more sharks would turn up to the feeds. And through the simple process of larger predators providing progressively smaller fish with an opportunity to feed through food scraps and bodily waste, the food web on Shark Reef began to grow. And this, in turn, rejuvenated coral growth. Contrary to their macabre reputation, sharks had brought life to a once dead reef. Although having convinced the villagers not to fish there, it was still susceptible to industrial fleets from outside Fiji. Thin, right? yeah. So they, they catch the shark with the tuna, and then yeah. what happens to the shark? The shark is back it's to right the away. sea. It's right, right. it's right out to the sea. Because it's not worth money? No, nothing. He only took the fin. Only the dead one. <clears throat> so what about quantity? Could you deliver, how many kilos could we get, let's say, uh, one month. Oh. In one month, yeah. You have only one month, maybe one ton. One ton. One ton? In 2003, when Mike Newman arrived, he came with a plan. Well, I've been diving forever and witnessing the decline in the oceans. And when I retired, I said, I want to go into conservation. Uh, I want to explore the South Pacific because I hadn't been there because it's so far away from Europe. So I set up a trip throughout the South Pacific, came across this place, found there was already a dive, found there was a nucleus for doing what I wanted. And uh, by training, I'm a project manager, so I set up a project. And the premise was no safari tourism, no African elephants. How can we translate that into sharks? Obviously, you can't protect the species, you have to protect its, its environment. You know, you can't protect jaguars if there is no jungle where they can live. So we set out straight away to protect the, the reef with all the fishes, right? not only sharks. I um, actually met Mike at Walker's Key in the Bahamas, and uh, we developed a good rapport. When he was starting this dive, we came over and, and worked on some consulting to see the difference and what we could do to help them with setting this up. We also worked on Walker's Key and setting up a marine park preserve and wanted to do the same thing over here and I hope that he'd pursue that, which he has, and we're very pleased. Oh, it's one of a kind, without a doubt. Uh, as you know, it's becoming harder and harder to see large groups of sharks because of the issue of overfishing. So when you come to a place like Shark Reef and you see all these large apex predators, that's an indication of how healthy the marine environment in Fiji is because you need a lot of food and biomass to support these big hungry sharks. So it's a dream come true for any photographer who likes big animals. The good news was that government and fisheries were very responsive. Uh, the villagers, a little less so, but after education and since from the beginning money started flowing, now you know, they're extremely happy, and, and that might surprise you, the fishermen are extremely happy because down at, they're catching more fish around, around Shark Reef. So they would probably be, the local guys would be our best friends right now because they understand the value of a marine park. I'm proud to be part of uh, the, that adventure in order to help the youngsters, the upcoming youngsters of this village. The sacks are giving money to the village. And the only way for us to keep that in line is to protect them. Protect the sacks, the sacks will protect you, and it will feed the village. 
Fiji for a long time has been looking after its marine environment. They were proactive. They decided to protect the sharks while they still have them. And when I first started coming here uh, six years ago, they have less sharks than we have now. And that's a trend that counters everything else that's going on in the world. We all hear about diminishing stocks of big predatory fish. And here, it's the opposite. And that's the beautiful thing. There is now shark fin trade coming into Fiji. And these things happen very, very fast. How many sharks are there on a reef, 20, 30? How long does it take a local fisherman to fish them? A week, and then they're gone. And then the reef is going to go to shit. And then the fisherman is going to lose all his income because he's not even going to be able to fish there anymore. When you talk about overfishing, the recreational guys are going to say, that's not our fault. That's the commercial guys. If you talk to the commercial guys, you're going to say the recreational people are also guilty. And the bottom line is, whether it's recreational or commercial, there's so much fishing and so much taking going on that it's unsustainable. You can only kill so many sharks, uh, and then the sharks will disappear. The sharks in various parts of the world, they're not an endless resource. They don't just keep coming in. It may be localized resident populations. When you fish them out, they're gone. You know, you can't rely on other sharks coming by and making use of that habitat. So once they're gone, a tiny little shark will have to start somewhere and swim to that location, you know, for there to be a shark again. And for a little black tip to swim over large stretches of water to the next reef, it's just not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. When the Shark Reef Marine Reserve was established in 2004, it provided sanctuary and protection, not just for the sharks, but for the reef itself and all its inhabitants. That protection was extended further in 2006, when the reserve grew to include the 30-mile stretch of water known as the Fiji Shark Corridor. Fiji had succeeded in creating a safe haven for all sharks within the protected area, providing temporary respite from fishing pressure for the more nomadic and migratory species, as well as developing a base for continued scientific research. The benefit to Fiji's marine environment cannot be overstated. This was a triumph of will and determination. The more time I spend amongst this incredible group of people, I am reminded why I was so passionate to tell this story. We've got this innate fascination with the ocean, and in particular sharks. It's kind of an iconic animal, and it's only the tip of that iceberg that ever seems to get spoken about. Maybe people want to see uh, the gnashing teeth and sharks jumping out the water and all that, and it's, yeah, that's great, but you can only see that so many times. You know, where's the story in that? You can engineer a story with that footage, or you can actually go and tell a story that already exists. And if no one else is gonna do it, I thought I might as well come out and do it myself. Every great story has a great starring cast. And here in Fiji, they have unrivaled access to some of the world's most recognizable and charismatic species. On the plateau of the reef, where the depth averages four meters, you will find black tip and white tip reef sharks. The black tip reef is sleek and beautiful. The white tip reef lithe and energetic. These are the sharks you are most likely to encounter on trips to the tropics where sea temperatures reach 22 degrees Celsius and above. Averaging around four to five feet in length, black tip reef sharks exhibit very strong sight fidelity, aggregating the localized areas and rarely straying far away. Here in particular, they play an important role in controlling the population of the reef octopus. They can also, very occasionally, be a little too enthusiastic. The white tip reef, a little bolder, will venture deeper down the reef wall. And despite their relatively small size, like the black tips, occasionally need a firm hand when they show a bit too much attitude. 
The grey reef shark is the archetypal reef shark species and a staple for shark divers since the 70s. It was the grey reef shark and its reaction to baits on camera which gave rise to the public perception of the feeding frenzy. The grey reef is also the shark species which exhibits the infamous agonistic display with arched back, dropped pectoral fins and S-shaped swimming pattern. The grey reef shark is widely distributed and can be found in most of the world's tropical seas. The tawny nurse shark is a type of carpet shark, sluggish and slow moving. The individuals here on Shark Reef are unusually large and bold, showing scant regard for the bigger and far more numerous bulls on the feed. Tawny nurse sharks here are more than a little dopey, a bit of light relief from the chaos of the reef sharks. The silver tip is only an occasional visitor to this part of Shark Reef, but one who is always keenly welcomed. Strong, bold and sleek, the silver tip could be described as semi-pelagic, in that although it is most commonly found patrolling the deeper waters around reef walls, its preference is for isolated, open ocean reefs. The silver tip can be aggressive, and any diver lucky enough to see one should be sure to have his wits about it. The sicklefin lemon shark is the Indo-Pacific sister species of the Atlantic lemon shark, distinguishable by the black spot on its snout. This is a big, stocky shark and can be aggressive when provoked. However, despite its muscular, intimidating appearance, the sicklefin lemon shark is more likely to favor retreat if threatened. The tiger shark is an icon of the animal kingdom, instantly recognizable with a confident, enigmatic personality. The tiger shark is a nomadic loner, equally comfortable in shallow, inshore waters and the wide open ocean. One of nature's most formidable predators, the tiger for many symbolizes the mystique and awe we innately feel towards sharks. The most famous shark from the feeds here is Scarface, an almost six meter long female, the jewel in Shark Reef's crown and the one individual shark everybody wants to see. The stars of the show, however, are the bull sharks. Not just any bull sharks, but almost certainly the world's biggest and the highest concentration of individuals in one place during a single dive found anywhere on the planet. Big and burly with the swagger of a heavyweight boxer, these sharks ooze charisma. Some seem to know they're the main event down here. Others are shy, cautious or aloof, but all are potentially lethal and all demand the diver's full attention. Bull sharks are also different than tiger sharks. They demand a different respect. Tiger sharks come across as being a lot mellower because they are on this permanent one speed. Bull sharks obviously are not. You see them dashing around, you can see what's behind there. Yeah? And their sense of space is different. So, you know, I see a lot of shenanigans with tiger sharks all over the world which are stupid and disrespectful. I don't think anybody would do it with bull sharks. I don't think you can just ever think of riding a three meter bull shark. I don't think anybody is that stupid, you know. All these sharks, and by virtue of that, all the life on Shark Reef falls under the stewardship of a handful of compassionate, enthusiastic and knowledgeable guardians. Local people protecting their local marine life education at a grassroots level, coming from people with a genuine bond to these waters. When I first uh, do this the first two, three years, and then I realized, sex is one of the very, very cool animals in the ocean. They learn very fast. Uh, they smell me, they know who is Papa, they know who is him, and who is Rosie. They are like my, like uh, dogs to me, you know? When you got dogs in your home, I really love the dogs. That's the same thing, I love my sharks. From my teenagers, I thought shark is a predator mostly which kill people. Uh, with right now, with a different point and working with the sharks, it really changes my mind. My dad's a fisherman, a commercial fisherman. So, you know, all the stories he used to tell about sharks and all, as kids we were, you can say frightened, but we watched the DVD one time and we were 
we really wanted to get into the seat to actually sit. So when I came and did this, I was taken aback. I've been together with this animal for quite a while. Uh, they are just like my children. <laughs> you know, I take care of those sucks, just like I'm taking care of my family. We are here to take them out and to see what we are doing. And from there, they can know that we love the sucks, so they can go back and tell the other people that in Fiji, they love sucks as well. We can do it also. I can't for the life of me stay in the office from morning till afternoon. I know that would be bloody boring. From my heart, you know, I'm proud to be a Fijian. As the days progress and I immerse myself in the culture of these amazing people, the trust grows between the sharks and I, and also in Mike's impressions of me as a diver and as a person. He understands my motivations and I respect his experience enormously. It's gonna be hectic for two or three minutes. You know, you have your thing, he's gonna look after you. Stay long, enjoy. You know. The more I dive on Shark Reef, the more I understand the protocols and the energy of the sharks. The feeling for where to be and how to act becomes more natural. We start to move further from the other divers into the no man's land where we're more exposed, more vulnerable. Sometimes the dives would be mellow, the sharks casual and relaxed. On others, they were anything but. Yeah, that's definitely sort of the most energetic I've seen. It was just right from the off as well. Straight off the bat, straight down there, bang, they're all over you. Gets the blood flowing, gets the blood pumping, makes you feel alive. A lot of sharks. The success of Shark Reef Marine Reserve and any ambitious conservation project relies on relationships. Relationships built on trust and mutual respect are the cornerstone of any long-term positive endeavor. And here in Fiji, as I become more comfortable in my surroundings, I reflect on my own relationships, perhaps most of all, with the man who's giving me this opportunity. Perspective. Open that hand. That's a normal size. My relationship with Mike, um, it's an interesting one because he's straight to the point. He doesn't mince his words, he doesn't mess around. He will just say it as it is, and I've got an enormous amount of respect for him. I was a bit nervous, actually, if I'm being honest. I mean, he's a very well-respected guy, and you've got to get the measure of him a little bit. It's going to be a good day when that Okay. No, it's going to be a good day for no, him. Yeah. No. He's going to hate me for saying this. He's not going to like this at all, but my whole life, I've been kind of, I guess, looking for a mentor. Even from a little kid, I'd write letters and, and try and speak to all these people. I, I'd, I always dreamt that one day they'd say, yeah, this kid might have something. He's enthusiastic, he's passionate. Um, let's give him a break. Let's say, oh, why don't you come over and dive with us? Uh, it never happened. And it's happened now, 32 years of age, Mike uh, has, has helped me come over. He's trusting me with the sharks. I can't help it, I respect him. Every day, I'm grateful to be here and to make the most of this opportunity. As the days pass, I begin to spend more time thinking about just how far I've come since I started this adventure. I'm very conscious of the fact that with life, you only get one go at it. Being from where I'm from, it's not an easy thing to pursue a career with sharks. Nowadays, sharks and shark conservation, uh, it's a fairly kind of mainstream subject at the moment. Uh, but back when, when I first became passionate about sharks, you know, no one was, was interested in sharks. I had nobody to interact with. And when you look at the opportunities to actually spend your life with sharks or making films about sharks, the two things that you need to do that and money and sharks, and I've never had either. The job that I was in, I worked for a great boss, for a brilliant company, they treated me really, really well. It just wasn't me. I wasn't enjoying life. 
I was going through the motions just to exist. And that's when I realized that there's a value in putting value in yourself. And if I was gonna start living the life I wanted to live, then I needed to make a change. And doing it is hard. Doing it is always backlash. It's always setbacks. It's never easy. It's never exactly how you thought it would be. Like any project, anywhere, you know, you need to keep the goal, you know, in sight and you have to work toward that goal. I really threw myself into trying to get the word of the project out there. I sent literally thousands of emails. I wrote proposals. I spent hundreds of hours on the phone, all to try and make contact with someone who would sit down with me and seriously discuss potential for the project becoming a reality. I also spent a lot of time on the road, traveling up and down the country to various network events and dive shows, just to see if I could find sponsors to help me get to where I needed to be. It was a really lonely existence. Um, I had absolutely no social life and any communication that I did have with people generally tended to involve rejection of some description. So dealing with rejection on a daily basis is not an easy thing to do. I also got a lot of criticism from people who could not understand why I was taking the risk that I was. They used to tell me that I needed to live in the real world, that I should just give up, it was never gonna happen. In the end, through a combination of sheer bloody mindedness and perseverance, I managed to pull it off and I found two people who were willing to take a gamble on me. Throughout the whole process, the only thing I had at my disposal was my belief in the project and my belief in myself. I knew that I was gonna get here, I knew it, I knew it. The story here will continue long after I've gone and long after the people who are, who are responsible for that have gone. Hopefully it continues in the mold that it has and keeps growing. Um, I'm just here to play a tiny little part to take this story to a, hopefully a wide audience that can look at it and, and be inspired by it. This is an amazing experience for me as well. It's a learning experience for me to then go on and say, right, okay, do you know what? I did it. I pulled it off. I did it. Now, let's do another one. I'm not in a position where I can take this for granted. This, as soon as we leave Fiji, this could all be over forever. And that really scares the life out of me. It absolutely terrifies me. The biggest part of my personal journey is diving every day. Each dive offering new opportunities to progress further into the shark's realm, and also to experiment with some new filming techniques. With eight feet of plastic drainage pipe and a few cable ties, we fashion a pole cam to capture multiple angles of the sharks feeding at 25 meters. That Mike and the team are allowing me the chance to try things like this gives me the confidence that they are feeling more and more comfortable with me gaining access to the type of shark diving reserved only for the elite photographers and videographers. However, the wisdom of presenting an expensive camera and housing to huge bull sharks and inviting them to get a good look down the lens is questioned on more than one occasion. As soon as we push the camera out to film, it becomes a magnet for the sharks, taking hit after hit and bite upon bite, smashing the glass dome port into the roof. Even a tawny nurse comes to investigate before giving it a solid whack with her tail. Every day I'm growing in confidence. The belief that this is what I was always born to do only serves to heighten every sense and emotion on each dive and my relationship with Mike and his team is growing stronger. There is still much to do though, and there is no guarantee I will get the chance to do what I came here to do. Experience the outer reaches of the shark feet without a bodyguard. Something Mike calls walkabout. In terms of the, the people who are vehemently against shark feeding, seeing me getting this opportunity, they might say that it's irresponsible on Mike's part, allow me to do it. But at the end of the day, I'm not gonna be doing anything that I don't want to do. In the event anything were to happen, I would take full responsibility for that. He is taking a big risk, actually, I think. If he lets me do it, he's, he would be taking a big risk and it would mean a lot to me that he gives me that trust. 
He's, he's on his way. You know, from the first day he came, he's on his way. I, I think he understands what these bull sharks are potentially, that he has to respect them, and I think he does. You know, I haven't seen him do stupid things like trying to touch them and ride them and pet them and all of these things. You know. If Mike and his guys can see that I have that respect and that they think I'm ready for it, then I think, you know, I can get closer to these animals. Uh, and it's also that I can have that respect for them and that they see that it's a two-way street. I can't really see Dave being face-to-face -face with a three-meter bull shark with shoulders like this and not being apprehensive. That wouldn't be natural. Then he would be an, a raving idiot, and he is not. It comes down to things like weather and conditions, you know. If I want to get really close and, and, and tie in with these animals, it entirely depends on, on the viz and on the conditions. If the conditions aren't there and the visibility is not there, then that's just not going to happen. There's nothing anybody can do about that. Um, how far along in the making him a shark diver do you think Dave can get in, in the four weeks here? It depends on him. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know. The issue of shark feeding is a contentious one, and one which is central to the shark reef story. Here, they feed the sharks on tuna heads discarded by commercial fishermen and sourced from a fish processing plant. Twice a week, sometimes more depending on supply, whilst clients are out enjoying the feed, crew member Selesh will fill the truck with as many heads as will fit, a maximum load averaging between four and 500 kilos packed tightly into the truck, ensuring not to leave behind any he can carry before taking the 40 minute drive back to the dive center where the crew will unload the day's haul. After the last of the day's clients have left, they set about filling the bins and sacks for the following day's feed. Almost half a ton of fish heads, slowly defrosting under the hot midday sun, are prepared for the next few days. Whole heads for the bull sharks and heads chopped into smaller chunks for the reef sharks on the shallower feed. Early the next morning, before sunrise, I accompany Tumbi and Papa to see how they prepare the site for a feed. Due to the precise nature of the protocols here, that means taking all the food down to each location in person. Papa handles the topside duties, okay. and it will be Tumbi and I who take the food down, so we prepare for our short dive. Two bins, their lids tied shut, are slid down a rope attached to the reef below. I enter the water to act as lookout while Tumbi collects the sacks for the bait boxes. It's no surprise that the sharks are already patrolling below. Two grey reefs cruising slowly by as we descend into the dark, eerie silence. Another grey reef. This time, followed by a bull. I haven't seen one this high up in the reef since I've been here. We stay close together. I watch Tumby's back, making sure the sharks patrolling the murky water at the reef's edge keep the distance as he fills the box at 15 meters. Two full sacks of tuna heads are placed inside before the lid is securely fastened shut. More sharks begin circling. We attach one bin to the reef. This will be collected as the dive begins and lowered when the feeder is in place. In the course of a single week, the sharks will consume amongst them up to a ton of tuna heads. Around the world, the rights and wrongs of shark feeding are passionately debated by everyone from scientists and politicians to amateur enthusiasts. And I was keen to explore this controversy with a highly respected, locally-based biologist and conservationist, Helen Sykes, who, like me, has strong opinions on the issue. Shark feeding is a very sensitive issue, and there are extremes of opinions. And I happen to be at one extreme, and I know that there are arguments at the other extreme. And I have actually given lectures where I've, where I've represented both. But 
it's my personal opinion, and it's backed up by many other scientists' opinions, that in general, shark feeding is a negative thing to do. There's an environmental disadvantage. If you are bringing in many sharks into an area, you are basically overtoppling the food chain. You are bringing in more predators to an area which maybe cannot stand this many predators. So you are going to mess up basically the whole food chain as you go down the line. If I had the honest perception that what we were doing was harming the reef or harming the sharks in any way or harming the ecosystem in any way, we would have a talk and we would adapt our procedures. Our data show, and we have the data, so that the individuals never stay for a long time in shark reef. Yes, there are at times up to 100 bull sharks, but the composition is always different. And I doubt that they hunt on shark reef. I doubt it very much. None of us have ever witnessed that. And, you know, the camera is always running and never has it been on camera. So I don't think those 100 bull sharks or 50 bull sharks are staying on shark reef. I know they are not and are not hunting on shark reef. They disperse and we got the tracking data to prove that. If you are feeding things that are unnatural, and this will depend on the shark feed, then you may be messing up the biology of the shark. You may be stopping it from eating its normal prey. You may be bringing more of them into an area where there would not normally be this many sharks. So you may be affecting their whole breeding and feeding and general nat natural behavior routine. Sharks are scavengers. Humans uh, have been giving food to sharks since we first started building boats and going to sea and things going over the side of boats. Sharks have always benefited from humans going out to sea. They've always got food out of it. Um, so it's not a new thing. The nutritional value of a tuna head is small, okay? One individual shark might have taken in one or two kilos of tuna heads and the nutritional value of that, because it's all bone, is very, very low, so I don't think so. If the, uh, the shark feed was taken away, I think the population of bull sharks sitting up on shark reef would probably dissipate somewhat. They'd still swing by, but they'd just go back to doing what they normally do, which is what they do when they're not doing the shark feeds. Uh, you'd probably just see less of them. There's no need from a commercial point of view to have 100 sharks there, you know? Clients will be delighted to see 30 bull sharks, you know what I mean? So we're not trying to create a situation where we overload on sharks, make it more dangerous for us, obviously. You know, uh, this is just what happens. But I strongly, strongly believe that the life history of those bull sharks is not being impacted in a way where it would be detrimental to the, you know, the well-being of the sharks or, or the habitat. If you are coming to see trained animals, shouldn't you just go to Disneyland? I feel that if I go to, out to a reef, I want to see things in a natural environment with natural behaviour and, and there is no way that a shark feed can be perceived as natural behaviour. Those sharks will not come in if there is no food, full stop. In an ideal world, we could go to any destination around the world and dive on the perfect habitat and there'd be sharks everywhere and we could just go and dive, we wouldn't need to introduce food, we could interact with sharks on a natural level. The problem is, since humans have taken control of the ocean and and, and really ravaged it, uh, and the numbers of shark populations have just dramatically dwindled, you can't do that anymore. Um, so baiting these dives becomes a prerequisite to ensure that the sharks do actually appear. Do we condition sharks? Yes, we do. We condition them to come from the left to the right. That's a safety measure. We're conditioning to take tuna heads out of the hand of a person. It's glaringly obvious that they know what the tuna head is, what the hand of a person is. So that's the conditioning. So we're teaching sharks to take tuna heads off the hand of a person. Full stop. We're teaching them to eat tuna heads. One argument is, are you conditioning the animals? Yes. Are you conditioning the animals to regard people as food? Hell no. Are you making them less apprehensive of people Probably yes, you've seen what happens, you know, they will come in, have a look at you, very quickly find out that there is no food, very, very quickly. This is after 12 years of conditioning. This would be the most highly conditioned bull sharks on the face of the planet. A lot of those sharks as well 
don't come in to feed. A lot of those sharks refuse the food. The hand feeding sharks doesn't just make sharks think all humans will give me food. It just, sharks don't work like that. Oh, the people who say these things are just talking without having the slightest clue. And it's fine, you know, but in science what you do is you have a hypothesis, you go and test it. And it's fine, it's a hypothesis, but it's tested a thousand million times now. And it's just not the case. Here you have Bengar Island and uh, the lagoon where Shark Reef is situated, which is a mile that way. And then you have this huge, big, long beach all the way up here. And tourists are on here every day of every week, of every month, of every year. And there's never been a shark attack here. And people are going out there and there's 100, maybe 150 bull sharks out there, tigers, sicklefin lemon sharks, silver tip sharks. Why would they come and start attacking swimmers? It doesn't change their behavior enough. Do we look at the global chart of shark attacks and is there any correlation whatsoever to people hand feeding sharks anywhere? And you know the answer to that. I have to admit that one of my strongest arguments, which was that you would encourage aggressive behaviour in sharks, seems to have been fairly much disproved by a lot of the feeds that we've seen here, in that we've had two feeds operating in these areas without any real serious accidents. And I had predicted that something would have happened by now, so I do have to come down off my soapbox a little bit on that one. Don't be afraid of sharks. Let's not make them into cuddly toys. They're not cuddly toys. Let's have respect for something that is an apex predator in its own environment and let's learn to live with it. The arguments on both sides of the shark feeding controversy predominantly center around the issue of behavioral change and the effects not just on the sharks, but on all life on the reef. It can't be denied that behavioral change does occur, but here, nobody had expected to see what adaptation in particular, an adaptation which appears to be completely unique to shark reef. Take a look at this clip. Did you see it? Have a look again, this time in slow motion. As the shark takes the tuna head, have a look at the bottom left of the screen. A large, giant trevally rushes towards the shark's left flank, causing a small remora to escape to the shark's right, where another trevally is waiting to take advantage. Again, watch the shark's right flank. Here, the Trevally sneaks up behind the unsuspecting remora, gobbling it down in lightning quick speed. That's a story nobody has ever shown. A new food source where probably one Trevally discovered it. Now the other Trevallis are learning from him. Probably one individual started it. The other is looking and said, oh, the Trevally will position himself at the, at the beginning, follow a shark, wait for their chance. As soon as the shark leaves the pit, the, the Trevally goes back to the feeder and waits for the next shark to come. That is his window of opportunity. If he misses, he goes back and waits for the next shark. And they don't attack the big remora, they attack, they attack the medium-sized one. Probably the single most contentious issue regarding shark feeding is the perceived risk involved with aggregating sharks to areas, habituating them to humans as a source of food. I was keen to explore this myself, so where possible, I would dive on shark reef on days where there was no feeding. Whilst there were bull sharks present, it varied between only five to nine individuals, as opposed to the 40 to 100 we would see on feed days and they would never venture closer than to within 10 feet of me. Their movements were relaxed and mellow, their interest in me varying from cautious, mild curiosity to complete disinterest. Even when I tried to get closer, they wanted nothing to do with me, instead preferring to patrol the distant areas on the periphery of my vision. 
even with poor visibility and strong currents ripping through the arena. This, the world's most dangerous shark, never once approached closely enough to pose a threat. Whilst the objections to shark dive tourism around the world are varied and at times vociferous, the quantifiable benefits are numerous, and not just on an environmental basis. Perhaps the greatest argument in favour of shark dive operations is their economic contribution to people in developing third world countries. Benga Venture Divers is a marine conservation project that is running a dive shop. We turn over a million Fiji dollars in direct turnover. The income we're making goes back to the staff, to the villages. We have a youth program in Aloha, and that's where all the kids are coming from. All the kids on the boat came through that youth program. I'm Silio Rangatima, and I work as a dive master here in Bangor Adventure Divers. The first time I've been underwater with the sharks, um, I was afraid of them. But as I get along with them, it's kind of friend relationship now. I get used to them, they get used to me. And we are friends now, so I can say. It gives me income, especially to my family, because I'm the only guy in the family that's providing food to the family. And it's helped very much for my sisters and brothers back at home to pay the school fees and their staff at school. And also for me also, I get new staffs every week. I've come to know that sharks are very important to our life because those sharks, they give me money income and that's how I live. I need them for my living. If you maintain a business model which relies on the health of a localised shark population, the value of that shark continues year on year. The Bahamas alone is making around about $78 million a year from the shark diving industry. Uh, from our point of view, it creates a market, you know, like with diving, it brings more tourists that are staying directly with us and that are yeah. staying in the resort, you know, and that the resorts contribute employment, taxes to the government, uh, buying of local produce, so it impacts agriculture and the rest of it. I mean, it's an you know, important part of our business now and an um, important part of the community, again, everything else that comes with it, you know. So it's definitely something that um, contributing economically or beneficially to everyone. It cannot be denied that this has been a positive for the local communities. It has created a marine protected area, it has raised awareness of the sharks for sure, it is bringing income to the local people. You know, the village really started profiting from when it became a marine park and there was control over the money and the money went to the people. Now I would say in those seven years, I would say 100, 120,000, it's a lot of money for a little village. The economic growth shark diving has brought to Fiji isn't limited only to those in the immediate vicinities of the feeding locations. When you set off on your holiday to dive with sharks, the resulting economic benefits begin at the airport and extend to local transport, which will take you to your resort where you've paid for accommodation and where you'll spend money on food, drink, and maybe also on the on-site amenities, services or trips. In the days when you're not diving with sharks, you may travel to nearby towns and cities to buy souvenirs for friends, try out locally sourced produce, and experience local culture. All the while, you're providing much needed financial income to areas reliant on tourism. Fiji is still a developing nation, but the economic boost provided by tourists willing to travel to see charismatic marine animals helps to provide jobs, sustain small businesses, arts and crafts. It supports local agriculture and service providers and creates training opportunities for youngsters, all of which encourages international corporate investment into the area. Conservation is increasingly becoming less an issue of environmentalism and more an issue of economics in a rapidly overpopulating world. The financial incentive to support sharks in areas where they create a sustainable, long-term revenue stream creates supporters of shark conservation, where otherwise they may be indifferent or, at worst, anti-shark. 
when resorts and businesses experience for themselves the direct benefit of shark conservation measures, protecting these sharks on a national scale becomes a more viable prospect. It can be difficult to promote protection of an animal with such an undeserved reputation, but to put it simply, if it pays, it stays. Before Christianity, there were shark gods in these islands, and the people still respect those traditional linkages, and it's amazing how strong that still is. And it's the people that will save the sharks of Fiji. I'm now halfway through my time here. Production's going well, the people are brilliant, and even the media want to know all about me. It would be fair to say, everything is going pretty much according to plan. We're absolutely storming through what we needed to do. Uh, the dives are going incredibly well. I'm achieving the things that I want to achieve. The weather's been superb, although it does look like there's a little bit of a front coming in, but it's the Pacific, isn't it? So I'm sure that'll pass over very quickly, but things are going amazingly well. That all changes with an onslaught of bad weather days and days of bad weather. The rain is torrential. We lose a week's worth of diving where I could have made the final steps towards moving further towards my ultimate goal of a walkabout amongst the bulls. When there are breaks in the rain, the wind is unceasing, creating terrible surface conditions. Great for the Hobie craft crews, but awful for divers. Bad visibility, strong currents and rough seas I mean, the opportunity to complete my journey is now under serious threat. What this weather's done is put everything backwards. Are we actually going to be able to do the things that we came over here to do? If I'm allowed to go get the opportunity to do, to do a walkabout with Mike, then it means that they've got that level of trust and respect that they know that I can handle it. I know I'm ready for it and I want to do it, but it's not my choice and, and, and rightly so as well. Um, if it's murky visibility, it's not going to happen. They're not going to put me at any risk for an unnecessary reason just to get a shot in a film. Um, it isn't worth it. I mean, I've experienced a lot of amazing things, but to not complete the journey would be hugely disappointing. As my penultimate day in Fiji draws to a close, I've accepted that perhaps it just wasn't meant to be and I would not complete my journey and achieve what I most wanted in my time here. It's been an incredible experience, but I can't help but feel disappointment that I will leave with a dream still yet to be realized. Uh, the weather is still pretty crappy. Over there, if you can make it out, that's Benger Island, on a sunny day, you can actually pick out all the greens and like the, the little houses on it, and that's only or maybe two miles away. And you know, we've been joking that if you can see Benga, it means that it's about to rain. If you can't see it, then it means that it is already raining. Um, but still, no real break in the weather. Benga has now actually almost completely disappeared. So that means in about 20 minutes, there's gonna be another downpour, I think. If going walkabout with Mike doesn't happen, still made it out here. I still did it. It's not necessarily the story that I, that I had in mind to tell, maybe, and maybe the end of it is, isn't the amazing, joyous climax that I hoped it would be, but I've experienced amazing things. That in itself is a, is a positive aspect of it, either way. I'm standing on a beach in the rain. I'm standing on a beach in the rain in Fiji, so it beats Skegness. No offense, anyone from Skegness. As night falls, I head down to the bar and spend the evening with fellow guests and friends. We talk about all the highlights from the past month, and I resolve to return one day and finish my journey. I meet new people, interested to talk to me about sharks and shark conservation, and I reflect on what can only be described as the greatest adventure of my life.
Mike. What's going on? Um, today's the day to go walk about. Like, I was so worried that, like, um, with the weather, that it was going to mess it up because I was presuming that we weren't going to be doing it, but we are now. So it's nice to get to the dive centre and, and uh, on a day before a dive and like to get that heart going thing again. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really happy with that. I couldn't be happier actually. I just want to get it kicked off now. This is what I came here to do. He's going to put you first. He's going to put you first here. Right. Till, you know, till the guests leave. Okay. Guests leave, Rusi starts coming down high, and then you will go this side, and this is where it happens. Okay. And hopefully, probably, the current is going to go this way. Stay away from the cloud of bait. Okay? Because in the bait, in the cloud of bait, the smells of fish, the sharks don't see any better than you do in that cloud. You don't want to be in the middle there and them making a mistake, yeah. okay? Because navigation is, is, is in peril. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. wanted to do was make films about sharks, to spend my life with them and to achieve the kind of things I've always felt I was born to do. I don't just want to do this, I need to do this. I've been given a chance that people like me just don't get. And finally, I can say that I actually feel truly alive. As I begin my descent, accompanied by white tip reef sharks, for the first time I can feel the nerves growing inside me. A kind of hyper-awareness envelops me, almost as if I can feel every single movement under the water. This only intensifies as I pass through a group of very large bulls, searching for the last of the tuna heads dumped from above as the day's feed reaches its conclusion. I leave Arthur, and make my way to the wall to wait for Mike. It's busier than it has been on recent dives. There's a lot of sharks. Today, they seem even bigger than usual. Mike arrives, and as the main feed starts to reach its conclusion, we make our way out to the first stopping point of the dive, where we can evaluate the mood amongst a growing number of sharks. They are everywhere. The visibility isn't great, and the further from the wall we go, more appear in the distant murk. They initially keep their distance, watching our every move, but as we near our destination, they begin heading directly towards us. Mike motions for me to head towards a small coral mount right in the center of the arena. All I can hear around me is the snapping of bone and crunching of teeth as the sharks above me grab the remaining tuna heads. 
The sharks down here shadow me the whole way. I can feel their every move. And for the first time this month, I can feel my heartbeat steadily increase. After what feels like an age, I finally reach my first vantage point and can see the drop off. The sharks keep their distance, ghostly shadows patrolling back and forth with a majestic grace. Their power and ferocious reputation belied by a cool indifference. I am more in awe of them than ever before. A huge pregnant female breaks from the group and approaches with a speed and purpose which takes me by surprise. She seems almost as startled as I am as we make eye contact, only to turn on a sixpence and come around again for a better look, this time with a more measured approach. Her size and speed and the constant sound of snapping bow serve as a reminder that these are animals which demand the utmost respect. 60 or so sharks surround us from all sides. It's impossible to keep an eye on all of them as they move in closer. Above me, they swarm in ever-decreasing circles, making the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I have never felt so vulnerable in my entire life. By now, the initial caution amongst the sharks seems to have gone completely, and a never-ending stream of them move in from deeper water to join those who took part in the feed. We are completely surrounded. As if from nowhere, Rusi arrives with a bag of tuna heads, and it is here where I know the energy will be very different in the next minute or so. Emptying the heads into an opening in the coral, Rusi may as well be ringing a dinner bell. He disappears into a swarming melee of fish as the sharks approach, their movements quicker, more intense. They approach as if in formation, completely ignoring me. The giant moray, a constant companion since I arrived at his spot, seems less keen to watch the action and makes a hasty retreat as the sharks surround us and the feeding begins. The calm and measured demeanor of the sharks changes. Their behavior becomes more energetic. Everything is faster, more immediate. What felt as though it was almost under our control has become raw and visceral. It is spectacular and sobering. We move in closer. By now, I'm only a few feet away from the pit where the sharks are feeding. The sound is thunderous. The roar of water as the sharks jostle for position is punctuated only by the snapping of teeth and crunching of bone. An enormous female moves to my right. We make eye contact. My heart stops as she flashes only inches from my face. My entire body seems to be running at full capacity. I see everything. I hear everything. I feel everything. Being here, in this moment, is like having everything in the world turned up to 11. And then, in a split second, time stops. My heart almost bursts through my chest as she grazes my head with her belly. Another large female moves in as I am swiped by a tail to my left. I am in the middle of a pack of feeding bull sharks and there is nowhere else on earth I would rather be. More sharks move in to feed. They seem more accepting of me as though they realize I am not competition. I am by no means made welcome, but I am tolerated. Again, as one shark approaches me head on, I'm bumped by another to my left. It's impossible to avoid. I just have to stand my ground and appear on equal terms. A poker face which is as effective as it is absurd. As the tuna heads disappear, the change in mood is almost immediate. The sharks rapidly calm down. So much for the mindless killers frenzied with a single drop of blood. They have accepted me with surprising tolerance and an intelligent ability to differentiate me from their natural competitors and prey. It is an exhilarating, emotional and humbling experience. They begin to disperse, never straying too far from the pit and with good cause. A tuna head has been lodged in a crevice 
one lucky female managing to keep it for herself. Other heads, leftovers from the main feed, are dropped from above into a group of sharks who've stuck around. One final treat before we leave them be. Unfortunately, that time has now come. The last half hour flying by in a thrilling, life-altering blur. Mike signals for me to return and start my ascent. I'm rejoined by Arthur, and we make our way to the wall, leaving Mike and Rusi behind. I know that this is it, the final dive of my journey, and I don't want it to end. Energy and an overwhelming joy courses through my body. I feel like I could take on the world single-handed. It's as if these sharks have filled my senses with everything anyone could ever want to feel. In this month, these sharks have brought me to life. I make a point to survey shark reef for one last time. These are the moments I've longed for my entire life. There's no worry, no anxiety, just elation at finally realizing one of my life's ambitions. For the first time, I feel free. God, that was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. Oh, oh my God, it's getting so close. Like in, into the hole and then all like the, the sand and the dust and the bait would come up and then you can't see them and then they explode out of the middle of it. That was just out of this world. That was so good. It's a totally different perspective as well. Out there when it's sort of quiet, when they disappear and then kind of come back again. And they're all fighting over their heads in the pit. It's just amazing to watch and just be so close to it as well. That was brilliant. Do they show any interest in, in you? They passed through quite closely a couple of times, but not concerned about it at all. Oh um, no threat, no aggression, no nothing. It was amazing. What um, what word, or perhaps words maybe, would sum up how it, exactly you felt when you, you, knew, you were totally aware that you were swimming about free and, and behind the wall? Alive, finally. Proper, proper living, that. Not, uh, that was good. Awesome. Amazing. In every way. It really was. Yeah, that's what the kind of stuff I've been waiting for my whole life. So more of that, please. As we make our way back to the dive centre, I chat to the other divers about their experiences. We even have a few patches of blue sky, the first in a while. I am still exhilarated by my experience less than an hour before. I can't wipe the smile from my face. The worries and anxiety that I would leave without fulfilling my dream, now just a distant memory. Um, the last dive was absolutely amazing. Finally finished the journey from behind the wall to walk about and being on my own with no Arthur with the pole as well. It was very, uh, it was liberating, but you have a real sense of your own fragility when you're surrounded by dozens and dozens of enormous bull sharks. It was amazing. My heart was pounding more on that dive than any other. What an experience. It was awesome. The crew have one last surprise for me in the form of a carver ceremony, a tradition they reserve only for the most special guests and friends, and I'm honoured that they think of me as such. We share bowls of carver, a traditional Fijian speciality, and they officially bid me farewell. I'm humbled to have been made to feel so welcome by this wonderful group of people, the stewards who protect the sharks of Shark Reef with such passion and without whom such protection would not exist. I'm sad to be going, really sad to be going. 
I want to go back. <laughs> the thing I wanted to achieve was to get as close to these sharks as possible and get away from the, 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 the other divers on the dive, basically. Uh, so I can have that moment where it's just me and the sharks and I achieve that. The other things along the way, uh, the steps to achieving that in increments, everything taught me something. So I came over with one set goal and managed to achieve loads of other things along the way. So it really was a hugely valuable experience. It has been a momentous journey and it's had a very, very profound effect on me. Just in regards to how kind and how amazing the people are here. I came out here with a goal, set out wanted to achieve it, and I achieved it. So I feel very proud. This is uh, it's not the end, it's only the beginning.